Greetings. I'm Andrew Moriarty. I'm Jonathan DeGraw. And I'm Isaiah Casper. And for our EAPS 507 final project, we decided to do a spatial and temporal analysis of hurricane wind speed and storm surge data. And we specifically analyzed Category 4 Hurricane Ida, which made landfall in Louisiana earlier this semester. I'll now hand it off to Isaiah, who will discuss the goal of this project. So the goal of this project was to determine if wind speed and storm surge, the water level, are correlated in Hurricane Ida. So a little bit about the inspiration for this project. Me and Andrew actually went down and intercepted this hurricane uh, earlier this semester. So these are some pictures of our, of our time there. Uh, one of the, it was just really surreal, honestly. It was an awesome, it was an awesome uh, experience, and yeah, it was yeah, it was really surreal. We we really got to experience the high winds. Yeah, it was just a really uh, eye-opening experience, as Johnny said. You know, just taking in the hurricane force winds, the rain, and then seeing the damage afterwards. You know, it's just something I've never experienced before in my life, and really eye-opening. And we just wanted to analyze Hurricane Ida more after going through it. So some of the previous research that's been conducted on this topic was basically determining what part of a hurricane basically has the greatest impact on storm surge. What we were looking for more or less was which has a greater correlation, wind and surge or pressure and surge. So some of the factors that can impact storm surge related to hurricanes are the max wind speed, which is basically the ability for a hurricane to push ocean water, the speed of a hurricane. So a faster hurricane may not as have, have as much time to compile a larger amount of ocean water, to create more dangerous storm surge, whereas a slow-moving hurricane could do that exact thing. And the minimum pressure of a hurricane. Water displaced by minimum pressure can also be associated with enhancing storm surge potential. So here's a little chart from a paper from 2008 discussing certain uh, Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic hurricanes which were anomalously strong and produced a very high storm surge. So one in particular was August of 2005 with Katrina which produced a storm surge upwards of eight and a half meters, which is about 27 feet. Its minimum central pressure was 919 millibars, which is anomalously low compared to most hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. And then we also can look at Hurricane Camille, which also had a minimum pressure of 910 millibars and produced a, the second tallest storm surge on this data set of 6.9 meters. So even though the wind speeds aren't listed, both of these hurricanes at their peak intensity were category five with extremely strong dangerous winds. So this is just basically a graph showing what the components of a hurricane and how it will impact the surge when it makes landfall. So we can see that most of the surge related to a hurricane is wind driven, but 5% of that total is also pressure driven. So it's important to look at both and try to find a correlation between the two variables. So here we found two papers which kind of discuss these topics in pretty good detail. And in the first paper, they discussed that storm surge magnitude is typically better correlated with wind speeds prior to landfall rather than wind speeds at landfall. So basically what they're saying is that the peak winds before it makes landfall has a greater impact on the storm surge potential than the winds that are being recorded within the hurricane at landfall. And they also found that the maximum sustained winds and peak surge levels were not always necessarily nonlinear. It was found that by doubling the maximum sustained winds of a hurricane increases the surge potential by a factor of 4.59. In the second paper, they found that as winds increase or decrease in speed, the ocean lags behind. So at each time there's a change in intensity within the hurricane, they may not always be a direct relation immediately to the storm surge as well. It may take time for that correlation to occur between peak wind speed and peak storm surge. So a little bit about our methodology and what we did to further this research that was done by others. Um, so the, the types of data that we used were METAR data, tide and current data from NOAA, and NEXRAD level two radar data, which was really just used to give a to make a plot that would uh, help help us uh, visualize or or, uh, or provide explanation or context for the for this analysis. So uh, for the METAR data, we took all available stations from Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And we obtained this data from the University of Iowa ASOS network site. Uh, they provide on their website R and Python scripts, which we tweaked but did use to download this data. 
Uh, it should be noted that a wind speed reported by METARs are averaged over two minute intervals. However, wind speed averaged over one minute intervals is used to determine a hurricane's category. Also, several stations were damaged or lost power during the hurricane or as the hurricane made landfall. And as a result, the wind speeds reported by METARs appear to suggest a hurricane that's much, much weaker than a category four, which is the official rating from the National Hurricane Center. Um, so there's obviously a negative bias here in the, in the wind speed data provided by METARs. Uh, once again, we, we got the current and tie data from NOAA's official website, and we downloaded those manually. So we downloaded it file by file. As a result, the amount of data that we have from that site is much less than the data that we have from the METAR site. Um, so what, what type of manipulations did we do? Uh, to this data? Well, for the METAR data, we did a spatial analysis, a spatial and temporal analysis, um, 2D. Uh, we aggregated all the data into a single data set with time as an index. Uh, we uh, took uh, all the stations reported data at a slightly different time. And as a result, we took the max wind speed from each hour reported at each station at e in, within each hour. Um, we used hours from the August 29th, 2021 at 0Z to August 8th, 31, uh, 31st of August uh, 2021 at 0Z. Uh, the, if a station reported, uh, as, as previously mentioned, is this, if a station reported uh, more than one uh, data point per hour or more than once per hour, the highest wind speed was kept. And before plotting, we used a Crespin interpolation to approximate data at other locations on the map. For the water level data, basically for the spatial and temporal plot, 2D plot, we did the same thing. Uh, for the 1D plots, we, we didn't really do any aggregation or anything. We just took the data that, we, that they, were, they, were give, they, go, they gave us, um, and we did that for four specific uh, stations. Um, we also did a linear regression for two of those stations. We couldn't do it for all four because the lengths of the data sets for the wind speed and water level were different. And so we couldn't do uh, that linear regression for two of those sites. So just to give some context, to provide some context, this is a radar plot. We did plot this ourselves. Um, you could see that the hurricane made landfall, according to this radar plot, at around 17Z on August 29th. The wind speed is pl plotted here on time. Let me move our faces. Uh, you can see that the... Uh, Around the time it made landfall, there was some decently high winds uh, at coming along, uh, coming uh, onto the coast. And about that same time, you can see that uh, several of the stations were pro reporting water levels above uh, eight uh, feet. So uh, you can see, e even from the spatial analysis, you can see a little bit of a correlation. But that is even more apparent when we look at the 1D analysis. All right, so now I'll take it away with the 1D analysis. So we compared the storm surge and wind speed when Hurricane Ida made landfall, and we used the four tidal gauges along the Louisiana coast where the eye of the storm went through, like Grand Isle right here, uh, Pilot Town, Shell Beach. And as you can see on our plots right here, which were done on Python, um, when the hurricane made landfall around 3 p.m. Central Time to about like uh, 10 p.m. Central Time, that is when... Uh, you can see the wind speeds increased, but also the water level increased at about the same rate um, on the plots. So that shows that there was a strong correlation in all these locations between wind speed and uh, storm surge. And just to um, in, like enhance our results, we used the linear regression at Shell Beach and Pilot Town, and it shows that there was a strong correlation between the wind speed and water level data just to back up our data analysis even more. So in conclusion, we can just say that there's a strong relationship between storm surge and wind speed data. Um, and as a result, when Hurricane Ida made landfall, the amount of storm surge appears to have peaked when the sustained winds were greatest. And um, also Hurricane Ida, when it rapidly approached Louisiana coastline, the data from the tidal gauges showed an increase in water levels and wind speed with time. So going forward, there are many avenues of potential future research that could be pursued. One particular topic of interest would be to explore the correlation between the size of a hurricane and a potential maximum storm surge as a result. 
So some studies have argued that the size of the hurricane is more important than the actual max wind speed or minimum pressure. Examples of this would include Ike and Katrina, which both produced record-breaking storm surge for their respective landfall locations. On approach to landfall, though, Katrina rapidly weakened, yet produced one of the highest storm surges in American history. But since Katrina was also anonymously strong and large, it might not be the best case study going forward. But in general, just studying the size of a hurricane and what relation that might have to coastline storm surge would be very interesting. So uh, in conclusion, we had a lot of fun doing this project, uh, and we were able to prove that wind speed from a hurricane does impact storm surge. Thanks for watching.